statics with this Forschungsgruppe, the research group of APEC. So the agenda will be starting with aesthetics, definitions, history. Then I will talk about, that's the most important part of the whole, um, about phenomena of aesthetics in everyday life. And then I want to go one step further towards uh, a theoretical framework. And um, to also to answer how could we and how should we research aesthetics in the future, then I will have a coda in the end. So, aesthetics. First, I will go, I will deep, deeply dive into a history about definitions, origins, theories, which stakeholders are inter interested in the field and applications. So, aesthetics, by the way, some write it aesthetics, the others are aesthetics. So, it is delivered, of, of course, it's a Greek word, an ancient Greek word, uh, which means perceptive, sensitive, pertaining to sensory perception. So, um, it is mostly a sensory act, and it's focusing on the processing, that's important, the processing of the stimuli. So, it's not just about the stimuli. Uh, and it was newly coined by uh, the German uh, philosopher Alexander Baumgart, maybe you know, uh, in his PhD thesis, uh, Meditationes Philosophicae de Nonulis at Poema Pertinentus, uh, in 1735. He, he coined it, and then his major work was the Aesthetica. Baumgart is aesthetic, founded the science of aesthetics, that's, that's clear, he developed the aesthetics to mean that it is something about the taste. So it's about tasting and it is about good and bad art. And um, the taste is always linked with beauty. And aesthetics is a deduction of principles of artistic or natural beauty from personal taste. It's personal taste, it's empirical from the start of. And, um, Baumgarten's Metaphysica, he also um, wrote about um, aesthetics, more about um, the judgment of taste, and it is based on feelings of pleasure and displeasure. Still very, very important topics and variables that we use in everyday um, aesthetics today. So um, Kant was also a major leap forward, um, uh, especially, um, and most people don't um, register that, it's not by his later work, but in the Kritik der Rein Vernunft of Pure Reason. Um, uh, it is only a side note there, but essential uh, was the, the statement, aesthetics is a psychological aesthetics. So we could also call him the, the founder of psychological aesthetic, which is most important for me. In the Kritik der Urteilskraft, um, where um, uh, it's, it's um, the critic of judgment um, uh, in English, um, he again pronounced that it is an empirical issue, but with universal validity. That means there is also some wrongdoing in having a personal taste. That's a little bit a strange concept we have to talk about it maybe in the next days about that. Um, it's something people often misunderstand is this idea of disinterestedness. So Kant doesn't say it doesn't interest us or there is no interest in it or there's no function in it. That's a misreading. That it is not interesting whether this object is real, whether it's imagined, whether it's definable as an object. So, and most importantly, it's purely subjective as an emotion. So, and then maybe the milestone, the, 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 the founder of real and modern, you know, I had a lot of founders, but um, this is typically known as the one who really did experimental aesthetics and not only empirical or stated that it's empirical, and that's of course um, Fechner. Fechner's Vorschule der Ästhetik, but also his writings before that. These are very important, for example, the, from 1866, but in 1876 he 
founded really empirical aesthetics, what we know now as empirical aesthetics, also from a psychological point of view, although he was, of course, not a typical psychologist because psychologists were not born yet. Um, so, um, from a content point of view, this is also important because most people in psychology neglect that. So, it's not only an early piece of psychological research, it's the oldest empirical part. Most, sometimes people say, well, it's the second oldest because Fechner also founded psychophysics as a topic, but it's not a topic, it's a method. So from a content point of view, aesthetics is the start of empirical psychology, you could say. And nowadays, it's a quite neglected area, you know? We are not the biggest group here, but if you would call, for example, memory or something like perception as such, there would be a much larger community. So it's now a side project of psychology, but it is the seminal, the start of psychology in modern times. <laughs> so, and we have the mean, uh, here the, the statement or very clear opinion that it is possible to more or less define shapes and dimensions of aesthetically pleasing objects. And I think we have a good example here. We can do it with a vase, for example, by Emily. This work is a it's a very typical uh, word on, on that. We can have also here a research that is in this tradition of morphic. Um, so um, then there was also an interesting development later on, starting in about uh, fin de siècle, so 1890, uh, that was Gestalt psychology um, founded or maybe established. It wasn't founded, it was never really founded by von Ehrenfest and then uh, further um, uh, developed by uh, Kula, by Kofka. Uh, by their timeline and so on, and the essence is now the perception is a holistic impression. And if you have seen my Bamba Holzman before, that was a Gestaltist idea. There were only dots creating the idea of a horse and a man on the horse. And in the end, something like art, from my perspective, is not dividable that is an uh, artwork in a context. So this would be very, very in line of von uh, Um The Gestalt laws, you know, probably it started with melody metaphors um, and uh, it had in ensemble impressions. So the parts make up the impression, uh, not the singular parts make the impression, but the Gestalt. And if you are interested in experiences and impressions, you always should go for the Gestalt. And um, these Gestalt ideas were also um, put on um, by uh, very influential art historians like Gombrich, who is uh, probably one of the most prestigious guys uh, in, uh, around um, art history. And he was very much linked to the perceptual guys, the perceptual scientists, especially good Gestaltists. And he claimed that each art historic epoch takes a specific perception, uh, per perspective of perception. So there aren't any innocent eyes. We are always trained, educated eyes. We are cultural eyes. And there's a permanent processing of gaining information about the Umwelt, the Umwelt that is the social construction of the environment, especially about um, order and meaning. That was his later work on. And um, uh, then, in also a tradition not only by Fechner, but we have an example here also that is um, uh, put an emphasis on the line. Um, uh, that is his so called new experimental aesthetics. Oh, that's, that's the, the wrong, the wrong um, date. Sorry for that. So it was in the, it, it came up in the 60s, but it was uh, in a very, very strong mood in the 70s, but on the 1900, of course, 70 something. Mm -hmm. So it is a new, new uh, behavioristic approach. The artwork is a stimulus on which the subject reacts. So that's quite behavioristic. The aesthetic behavior can be derived from baseball needs and motivations, and the human attempt because curiosity is triggered by novelty. And uh, 
the line had a strong in, uh, influence on um, uh, the, the later 50 years of aesthetics, and especially neuroaesthetics is very much linked to the line. And then is another totally different stream of um, uh, ideas, that's information theory by Berkhoff. You see also an example here um, about Berkhoff. Um, and it defines an aesthetic measure on a mathematical model, which is of course wonderful uh, if you have such a model that is powerful and um, so the whole field of psychonomics is based on such ideas. And it's mostly about order and complexity and in a good relationship then you have a high aesthetic measure or aesthetic value. And it makes believe that aesthetic value can be measured, so it does not matter whether you analyze polygonal forms, ornaments, vases, or artworks. So, in a way, a very strong approach, but also problematic maybe if we really want to go to artworks. I come to this later on. So, and even sensory domains do not show specifics, um, he claims, um, but it's always following these rules. So, theories and literature are full of confusion in the end because we have such a rich tradition. And so it's very important um, that we also define from our start on, on which domain, on which theory we are relying on. There are no really you know, um, maybe uh, wrong uh, uh, aesthetic theories, but different traditions, and it's good and important to make clear what your research is based on. Then we know what it is about, and how we can derive some hypothesis. And it's and mo and most important, it's really, are you interested more in this art-related? So we have seen with, um, uh, for example, the dance um, uh, performance uh, in the upper floor that is clearly art-related. Um, or is it more aesthetics as such? Is it about everyday uh, aesthetics? It's about placing things in your furniture, uh, architecture, and so on and so on. But it's important to tell it apart. So it's really about the big AE aesthetics or the small AE. You know, the size is the same. It's not better, the one is not better. It's just these are um, uh, uh, capital uh, and these are uh, 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 lower uh, charts. So, which are the typical stakeholders um, who are involved in the whole research? Well, in the empirical uh, research domain, it's about psychology mostly, and sociology, neuroscience, design science, architecture, usability, and so on. Um, in the theory, it's mostly philosophy, artistry, social and cultural sciences, not so much psychology and the others, which is, uh, I, I think, uh, there's a lot of need for it, and of course a lot of practitioners. In fact, everything is aesthetics. Everything is aesthetics and we are driven by aesthetics. So applications are typically uh, with theories, it's about aesthetics, about art, we have uh, theories about pleasure, about preferences, all very important points. And, and products, of course, we have artwork, we have cultural goods, we have consumer <coughs> products, and so on, and especially in Europe, I would say, these things are very important. So you are very important persons, I would say, because um, it's, it's linked very much to uh, European spirit. So conclusion of paragraph one, which was about aesthetics. As such, we need a clear definition of aesthetics, at least at the beginning of all our scientific endeavors. We need to make clear whether we address art or more everyday aesthetics, which is also very important. For example, biological aesthetics, design-oriented aesthetics. And it's important um, because we are so rich, we are so <coughs> various in our communities, and we should also work together, but we need some common grounds. Else it's, it's very hard to find a way. It's definitely a challenge to work with Tudor, for example, that it's worthwhile. But therefore, it is important that we know some 
common grounds. So now I come to paragraph two, and that's about phenomena of aesthetics. The aesthetics is everywhere and everybody talks about it. The undeniable. It is a highly frequented topic. It's especially hot if it's about art and art-related things. I have just looked at Google Ngram that looks for um, English sources here up to the year of 2019 in books that are scanned by Google. And they have a lot in their, in their uh, stock. Um, and I, I just start at 1989. Um, uh, because this is a kind of, um, there was some kind of modern time started. Uh, it is about uh, the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall and the breakdown of the Soviet area uh, started about that. So um, it, it's, an, it's an interesting new phase of, um, uh, of our culture. Of course, there's also a set one here um, that, that we have been making now, also a change in our culture with the invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, and it's, um, here you see um, just the word aesthetics. And you would say, well, that's, that's very low numbers. But just um, compared with sports, you know, sports is everywhere, you would say, but sports is much less frequently used and all these publications that were scanned. Even Trump, you know, he had a rise. Maybe it goes further, um, but um, uh, not, so, not so strong than aesthetics. Um, politics, stronger, and art. And if you go further, that's the magical thing with art. You can go 200 years further back, and you see always art as an influential piece of our culture so it is also written on art. So our world is dominated by aesthetics. If you, if you just look at um, uh, Bing, for example, um, uh, then you see um, rose aesthetics, vintage aesthetics, aesthetic clothes, uh, you see blue aesthetics, whatever this is, 70s aesthetics, uh, museum aesthetic, aesthetic beauty, artistic aesthetic, and so on. A lot of, and you know, there are only a few places now filled, with colors showing the variety of aesthetics. It's everywhere. And it's very hard to define what it is. Is it about colors? Is it about goods? It is about culture. It's about time. Very, very difficult. So aesthetics which appeal us change over time. That is one of the most important phenomena we should register. There seems not to be an eternal aesthetics available. So one influential theory that was attacked quite recently, very often, and I think for good reason, that still there are some nice evidence. So um, uh, the, the guy who invented the, um, or introduced the effect was uh, Rob, uh, Robert Science uh, in 1968, and he had some really appealing um, graphs in his original <coughs> publication, and it was always clear if something is high frequently used, uh, for example, words, or um, uh, for example, um, he, he looked at um, names and so on, then it is like better. So, mere exposure, just the exposure to something increases liking. So, liking as such is not for sure. Um, but it is also clear then we can change it very, very easily and, sit, um, and, 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 and easily, um, even if it's more complex and even if it's well established. So this is the Louvre version of La Cioconda, of Mona Lisa, by Leonardo from 1503 to 1517. He worked um, a long time on it, and um, it's a true masterpiece. Most people like it very much. And they like it why, when we ask them, they often say, well, the colors, they are wonderful. They are so harmonious. <coughs> well, in fact, there aren't any colors anymore. So a little bit brownish, yellowish, because the varnish on top of the painting is totally wrong. It is yellowish. So typically, um, the conservatory uh, guys should go to the Louvre and say, well, 
let's um, uh, uh, drop or remove the varnish, the old one, and just put a new one. Typically, this is done with other Leonardo's. It is done, but Mona Lisa, you know, is something sacred. And so they have never touched it. So, um, but it's not the original coloring, but people are used to it, so they like it very much. So if you look at a second uh, version that is in the Prado Museum, it's also an authentic um, uh, uh, version of the Leonardo artistic studio at least. Probably also parts are from Leonardo, and that's totally different. People attending our uh, research lab, they say, wow, that's kitschy, it's awful. It's an awful version because it's so bluish, it's colorful, it's not a Leonardo. Well, it is probably, at least from Leonardo's school, and probably he worked also on it, which we have proved some years ago in 2014. And, but the interesting thing is, they don't like it due to the color of, of, although this is the original color spectrum they used. So, if you just do the following, I. You know, I, I have not the money, I have not the power to go to the Louvre and um, remove the varnish, but I can do it digitally. So I made some research on which filters you have to use uh, to come up to the original uh, painting. You know these algorithms, for example, for your vintage pictures from the 70s and so on. This is the version we created. And it's not a fake, it's just filtering. You know, the colors are there. With the exception of the, of the leaves here, it's nearly the same. And what did the people say? Awful. Awful. So, but now I was not satisfied by that because it doesn't um, reflect what I'm really interested in. Um, so we created versions that are between Prado and the Louvre version, the original version, this yellowish, brownish, non-colorful one. And we did a lot of morphs and warps in between, just to have more Prado-esque or more Louvre-esque pictures out of it. So, and then we started the research for one group with, okay, this is a nice picture, look at it, you have 10 minutes uh, and now fulfill the following tasks. Is she smiling? What's the background? So it's all about the picture, but not about the liking. Only description, 10 minutes, they are forced to look at it, to elaborate on it. And, okay, this is, you would say, well, this is the typical viewing conditions that you already have. These are the visual habits because we know the Mona Lisa, of course, very well. So, um, it's not, it's not um, unexpected that the more Louvresque it is, the better the light. Okay? This is easy. But now we go to the Prado version, the one that doesn't look so nice. You know, oh, people, a little bit kitschy and so on, it's too colorful. But people had to elaborate 10 minutes. Normally you don't have these 10 minutes. You, you look at it, no, no, that's not the one. And then we look again at the preferences. And here it is the artistic quality. And we see clearly the Prado-esque versions are better and, you know, a little bit of the Louvresque version in it, but more to the Prado-esque, that's the perfect Mona Lisa, after 10 minutes. And the appeal, the artistic quality, is higher than ever before. So it changed within minutes, within 10 minutes. Aesthetic can also be instantly increased by aesthetic aha, an idea that was brought um, uh, forward uh, my Claude Mood, uh, who, who is also sitting here and has a keynote after me in the afternoon. Um, so if you look at such a picture of Pollock, for example, people are stunned and they like it and they are sometimes overtaxed, but then they find out, oh, you see, here, ah, the hands <coughs> of the master, Jackson Pollock's hands, aesthetic aha. It appeals at that moment, people love the picture. So we need often this aesthetic <coughs> aha. That's also a phenomenon. It's aesthetic <coughs> can benefit also from semantic instability. 
the so-called science concept that we have developed some years later. So aesthetic aha might benefit, but not sustainably. If you just need always this aha, it's not enough, <coughs> we think. So art processing is not um, problem solving. Aesthetic aha would be a kind of problem solving or visual problem solving. But um, I think it doesn't really reflect humans' approach to art. It's with other perceptual ideas, yes, and also with everyday aesthetics, it's sometimes, um, I think, very important. So what I want to say is, you know, this is something that we can really solve. This is problem solving. We have to solve this crossword puzzle. We can solve it. What do we do with such a solution? Is this sustainably appreciated? No. We throw it away. Or do you know museums? having in their stock crossword puzzles? Me not. So if you have an exam and you had the, the right answer, it's nice for your life. You make a maybe an aha, it's good for you, it's but it's not sustainable. And also with kitsch or everyday, most everyday aesthetics, you can solve it. That's the you know something linked this person with Christmas, so it's very clear what it is, what it stands for, but it is not art. So you have solved it and throw it away and put another on your shelf. So aesthetics can benefit from semantic instability, how we call it, science. It's a mostly interesting, this concept also about challenging art. Because it's sometimes something that overtaxes beholders, especially when they lack information. But when we have the resources and the freedom to approach art in such a mode where we allow semantic instability to grow, then it's beneficial. So if we, for example, put titles of the artwork that are challenging, elaborative titles, after a while, you like these elaborative titles much more than the descriptive, and if you have no titles, it's not benefiting at all. Or if you have disfluent artwork. So these are really artworks people didn't like in our study. So we filtered them out and said, well, these are so-called disfluent artworks. They are not really addressing the visual habits that they have in common. But the important thing is, this is the bar that is the gain for, um, uh, for these works after having elaborated on that. So if you allow it to happen, then people like them very much more afterwards. But the other artworks, they don't gain anymore because they are already in your visual habits. They are not challenging and there are no, no riddles to, to take. So aesthetics can also have transformative power, multiple evidence showing uh, personal transformations. We often report it. This painting struck us and it changed maybe even our life. So our perception and aesthetic experience reconsidered by our disruption and transformation. That is a, um, a theoretical claim. But also um, what we have found out um, quite recently is um, when we, for example, show such art uh, tattooed, and most people find it totally disgusting, although they eat pork, strangely, and they don't care about treatment, anything about the pigs. But here it, it, it really raised very strong protests and so on. The interesting thing is, if you show it as an artwork, people accept it. And what we saw is they, uh, um, they had lower sadness ratings. Thank you.